I apologize for not being able to physically be with you and also that um, I might be reminding, uh, reminding farmers how to, how to grow corn. Um, if there's ever a group that doesn't need to be reminded of the importance of remembering our humanity and placing that front and center, uh, it is the Pugwash and my colleagues on this uh, panel. Um, but I sort of feel like, uh, like my mother telling me to wash my hands before I eat. Uh, you can't say certain truths enough. So I'm going to lay out, before I get into just one point about human security, a little bit of context. And these are facts that are undeniable. And I think after facts, it's important to give opinion, but not until the facts are out there. Because of the abuses of science and technology, we're destroying, destroying species at minimally a thousand times the evolutionary base rate. And many scientists say it's up to 10,000 times. Since 1970, 60% of the world's mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles have been uh, extinguished. 8% of the Amazon rainforest has been destroyed. The last decade has been the hottest since recorded. Uh, we've been recording temperatures for at least 140 years. 28 trillion tons of ice have melted from the polar ice cap and poured fresh water into our, uh, into our oceans. The, uh, the CO2 average has increased by 12% since 2000, and uh, the, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere has never been this large uh, in over 3 million years. There are over 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world today. And since 2000, the world has spent over $32 trillion pursuing security based on military nationalism and the threat of global annihilation. If we continue on this course, in which the predominant focus of security is based on a 5th century Roman adage, prepare for peace, receive war, prepare for war, receive peace, peace through absolute strength, in derogation of even strategic stability, and now having, having uh, come to the point where we're hearing daily threats of the use of nuclear weapons and the UN system utterly upended by the war in Ukraine. We're at a crisis point, a true crisis point in governance. And ideas are really important right now. The last time I think the world faced such a, a, an important uh, necessity to change thinking was in the 1640s when Europe was being uh, decimated by the war between Catholics and Protestants. Somehow they had to be separated. Somehow that had to stop because people were killing uh, and not being afraid to be killed because they were fighting for eternal, what they saw as eternal truths. It's interesting we don't have anything like that now. We have very very little distance in our worldviews and our ideologies. And yet, we're in an existential crisis of our own doing. We are, in fact, making ourselves an extinct species if we don't change. In 1994, a brilliant economist in the United Nations Program for Development, Mabub al Haq, was thinking about where's the peace dividend with the end of the Cold War? Military expenditures were hardly decreasing at a rate commensurate with the change in threats. So he did a human development report in which he highlighted uh, a new concept, human security, centering security on people, 
on our humanity, not on states per se. Not that we shouldn't have states, not that we shouldn't have militaries, but the disproportionate emphasis. And the concept of human security is essentially freedom from fear, freedom from want, and freedom from indignity. And it's based on seven sort of metrics or principles of, of how to change our perspective more meaningfully about how people really live. Economic security, assuring that every single person has minimum requirements for a decent life, a place to live, enough to eat. Thus, the second principle is food security, ensuring physical and economic access to sufficient nutrition to live decently. And health security, guaranteeing a minimum protection from disease and uh, knowledge to uh, lead healthy lifestyles. Environmental security, protecting people from short and long-term ravages of nature and man-made threats to nature and the deterioration of the regenerative processes of the natural world. Since that time, we've seen the extraordinary, extraordinary ravages of our failure to address uh, the pandemic with a commensurate level of global cooperation. And I needn't highlight the dangers of our environmental irresponsibility with respect to climate change, but we often forget that 50 to 70 percent of our oxygen comes from the health of the oceans, the pH of the oceans upon which the health of phytoplankton depends. And phytoplankton is a single cell organism in the oceans that provides at least 50 percent of our oxygen. So it's like our third lung. Personal security, protecting people from physical violence, whether from the state, external states, substate actors, domestic abuse, predatory adults, gangs, so that people feel safe in their neighborhoods. Community security, protecting people from uh, the, the uh, breakdown of, of social, the social contract and community building and values that prevent us from having tribal, ethnic, and religious violence. Political security, assuring that people live, uh, live in a society that honors their basic human rights of freedom of conscience, protection of property, freedom of movement, and dignity. So political security, community security, personal security, environmental security, food security, and economic security None of these can be achieved today at a purely national level. Protecting the oceans, the climate, our lungs, the third, third lungs of the rainforest and the phytoplankton, addressing pandemics and integrated financial system, and the threat of nuclear annihilation. A different approach has to take place, an approach that recognizes the reality that the human family is one and science is telling us we have to change. We have to change how we heat our homes and we have to change how we pursue security. I have one simple point that I think has been overlooked in much of our deliberations on nuclear weapons because I think that nuclear weapons are sort of like the moral and practical litmus test of all of this. If we get every other issue right and don't get nuclear weapons right, we won't last long because by madness, accident, political distortions and design, they'll be used. The cost of nuclear weapons is exorbitant, not just in money, but in intellectual capital. But I think the largest cost that is not addressed consistently is the fact that nuclear weapons institutionalize adversity. They privilege the sectors in society that have this extraordinary power and the wealth and the intellectual justifications that go along with it. It privileges those sectors of societies that have them 
It leads to a distorted arrogance, the arrogance that in order to protect my state, I could risk the entire future of humanity. And it presents a barrier for cooperation, a barrier of addressing the very real threats that humanity's survival depends upon. And that's why the change is needed comes from those who started Pugwash. Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell's admonition to us, an admonition that can rescue us, an admonition that can recover what's most important, our humanity. Remembering our humanity, forgetting the rest. I don't know if we can forget the rest, but we can certainly put human security ahead of national militarism. Thank you.